Good afternoon, everybody. This is Joy Hall Bryant with DIR. Glad to have you joining us today. If we could go ahead and advance the slide. We're going to be talking about writing a statement of work today. Mary Vickery of DIR was going to be our presenter, but she had a family emergency. And so Colleen has graciously stepped in. Colleen, thank you so much. She had to kind of rearrange her day for us. Luckily, we have several subject matter experts in our procurement office. So thank you for covering. We also have Tom Hay and Tracy Romero helping us behind the scenes. So the three of us will kind of be doing the admin piece. Few announcements and we'll get started. So first off, if you want to learn more about these and other DIR events, you can go to the DIR website and check out the calendar. There's a calendar link at the top of every page. You can also join some of our mailing mailman lists. These are lists sort of like discussion lists. There are several. My area is IRM outreach. I work with different IT leaders. And so all the IRMs get these announcements and hopefully are forwarding them. You might want to consider DIR tech, which is any IT person in public sector or DIR train, that's actually the training community. It's not so much our attendees, it's more of a channel of communication. Those who develop and deliver training are pretty good about passing on opportunities. And then the procurement area has a list called IT sourcing that is a newsletter style list. That one's not a discussion list, but they send out information, typically one email per week and then special announcements. So you might wanna look at that. Today's program, DIR will award IRM CPEs and will document generic contact hours. We have applied to the comptroller to get the CPA type credit for this, but we don't know how that's going to work out. So we can't promise you that kind of credit. But we will be documenting IRM CPE credit and continuing education contact hours. That form is actually in the uh, handout pane if you want to download it now, but I'll also email it to you. We will additionally email a PDF of today's presentation, and then our hope is that we're going to post a recording. We have to edit the recording and add captions, and that takes a little more time, but we will be able to provide a recording. As you leave today, an evaluation form will pop up. We really appreciate that feedback. We use the feedback to improve our programs, but we also use it in our performance measures to help justify spending the time to provide these kind of free opportunities. So that is really valuable to us. Now, a reminder of the agenda today, we're doing a conventional generic presentation from two to three that should be information of value to any public sector person interested in statement of work. And then we'll kind of do a close out for those who want to drop off and we'll have a bonus session from 3 to 3.15. Those of you from state agencies, not including higher ed, does not apply to higher ed, but those of you from traditional straight state agencies will be going over specific requirements for statement of work that apply to you and you can stay on for that. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to mute and Colleen, you can, oh, question pane, sorry. You can pose your questions into the question pane. We have a lot to cover, so we'll have a limited amount of time for questions, but we will stop at uh, each section and take a few, and then you can always email the contact points and we'll give you that information. So now, Colleen, I'll go ahead and mute myself and you take it away. Thank you again. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this afternoon. As Joy said, I am Colleen Berkeley. I am the Director of Procurement Services here at DIR. I'm gonna briefly go through the agenda today. Um, it, we're gonna stick pretty close to the agenda, so just be prepared. Uh, we'll start with planning the statement of work with uh, project methodologies, uh, the waterfall and agile methods for doing statements of work. We'll talk about building a statement of work the standard elements that are in a statement of work, and I will give you an overview of the Agile templates. Um, we'll talk about the DIR SOW review requirements, and this is that state agency only section that Joy referred to, um, including the SB 533 threshold requirements. Um, I'll discuss some of the common findings that we are seeing as we are reviewing state agency statements of work. 
just to give you a heads up of what to look for in your own SOWs before you submit them through the portal. And finally, we'll have a generic question and answer period. But as Joy did say, we will be allowing questions at the end of each uh, section that we go through. So let's start with planning the statement of work. Um, statements of work, they are basically contracts. They are legally enforceable agreements um, between parties in order to receive work um, and include scope, schedule, and budget in them. Um, for those of you who don't know, statements of work can be issued against DIR cooperative contracts. So we have the DIR master contract. Each individual customer may issue their own statement of work against that contract to um, create their own binding agreement between the vendor and that, that entity. Um, and statements of work really need to have a clear scope a clear schedule for completion and budget. Um, that's really the core to having a good and effective statement of work that you can manage and enforce. So what's the statement of work life cycle? Um, first thing we all should be doing is planning. Statements of work should not hit you by surprise and you shouldn't be able to throw together something in a couple of hours and think that this is going to be a sufficient document, unless it is something that you have bought before and you're dusting off an old version of it. Um, in a statement of work, you have to define the need. Define the need. What is it that you are trying to solve for your agency or entity? Um, think about the risk of the project. How risky is it? What can we do? What um, guardrails do we have to put around it to make sure that we are not exposing ourselves to any additional risk by issuing this. And then you have to develop the statement of work elements necessary to manage the contract. It's not just enough to have the requirements to get the work. We also have to be considering what we need to do in order to manage the contract that results. Um, if you don't have those guardrails in place as you are putting that statement of work together, once you enter into that contractual agreement with the service providing entity, you will be um, hard pressed to find a way to ensure that they are delivering what it is that you needed for your agency or entity. Um, next, you're going to select the appropriate vendors. Um, you'll select either the list of vendors that you're going to send it out to if you're using a DIR contract we do have those predefined lists built into the statement of work portal. Um, you may, depending on your uh, thresholds and your individual entity requirements, select a subset of vendors that you are going to send it to without even looking at a DIR contract. Um, once you've solicited those vendors and received responses in, you're going to review those responses and apply some level of evaluation to them to determine which of the vendors that responded make the most sense for your agency or entity to move forward with. Um, once you've gotten through that whole process and negotiated with that vendor or vendors that you're awarding the contract to, then you would initiate the work with your selected vendor. Um, that is, typically involves transition planning, agreement on your schedules, um, making sure that everything has been locked up. And if you haven't done it during your negotiation process, I highly recommend this is where you would build deliverables expectations documents or start really scripting out what your um, sprints are going to look like so that you all have a clear understanding on both sides of the work to be performed. Um, if you have submitted your statement of work to DIR and you're using one of our master contracts, um, the final step once you have signed that contract with the vendor is to resubmit your st signed statement of work to DIR for the final signature. We have to do that secondary review for state agencies in order to ensure that you can pay the vendor. And I'll talk more about that at the very end of the presentation. Um, now that you've got the vendor on board, you're going to start managing that contract. 
um, what tools are needed on your side to manage the vendor's performance? What kind of checks and balances do you have to make sure that you're receiving the work that you needed? Um, and you also really do need to make sure you're documenting the vendor's performance. This is your way of creating a contract file that should there be any issues, you have a clear documentation trail that you can refer back to and use to support any arguments. Um, we hate to see that happen, but it's even worse if it turns out that you did not have the documentation of um, continued poor performance or deliverables that were late, missed, or missing elements, and you get to the point that you're ready to cancel your statement of work and you're unable to do so because you did not have that documentation. So I, I talked about this already, planning the statement of work, you need to define the need. When you're defining a need, you really need to consider not just the need that's right in front of you, cast a wider net. A lot of times, especially if these statements of work are being developed in a single business area, we are seeing that other business areas are impacted by decisions made by that single business area. If you have time, take it to make sure that you're involving all of the necessary stakeholders. Um, broadcast what it is that you're envisioning to the areas that you think might be touched and even to some that you think might not be touched or may not be interested. It's really important that you get all of those areas covered so that you're not trying to rework something once the contract has been awarded. Um, think about what the best approach for your project is. Does it make sense to do this in a very traditional waterfall development method? where first I complete step A, then I'll go to step B, then I'll go to step C, um, and I can't start any of those later steps without the completion of the earlier steps. Or is this something that can be developed in a more agile framework where I know what the big picture is, I know that there's steps that have to be taken in between, but those steps do not necessarily have to build one upon the other. Um, and then finally, you need to develop the statement of work elements necessary to manage that contract. So don't focus just on the business need, and I said this on the earlier slide, but also on what you need. Do you need monthly reports? Do you need weekly check-ins? Um, what is it, what's necessary for you to effectively manage that contract, manage the vendor or vendors providing services, and ensure that you're receiving the services that you have contracted for. Um, so stakeholder engagement is key. Here's the people that we typically um, see involved in successful statements of work. You've got to have your procurement and contract groups involved as you're developing your statements of work. So for you business area folks out there, I know sometimes it's really easy to forget that procurement and contracting um, is a stakeholder in what you're doing, but they will have some really great tips and tricks that they can um, give you to help you write a stronger statement of work that is legally enforceable. No one wants to be thought of as a barrier, and I know procurement and contracting, um, sometimes legal, and sometimes security can be seen as barriers because they're adding all this gobbledygook to your pure IT statement of work. I don't need to worry about any of that. And let me assure you, you absolutely do. Um, procurement and contracting folks have seen a lot of failed statements of work, a lot of failed requirements development, and they can help you. Your legal counsel is there to guide you and make sure that you are not going to be stepping into areas that could cause your um, agency problems. Um, you absolutely want to make sure that security is represented, especially in this day and age with the high number of attacks and security breaches that we're seeing in the public sector. So be mindful of those stakeholders. Um, program areas, if you're procurement and contracting and they have said, hey, I need you to buy this for me, don't then um, neglect to speak to them again. Make sure you're heavily investing 
in the program areas and bringing them in so that you can make sure that you are capturing what it is that they need. Um, as procurement and contracting folks, I will say sometimes we think we know better than the program areas, and we don't. We need to have that partnership um, in order to really make sure that you have a strong statement of work. There has to be an equal partnership and collaboration between all areas. And um, you cannot forget IT. Even for something that you think is not an IT component, there's IT impacts. Uh, onboarding of staff that may be coming on site, they're going to need to have um, user licenses to the programs that you're using. They may need um, agency or uh, entity owned machines and materials. IT has to know what their inventory is look like, um, looks like and or needs, sometimes they need to order additional machines, additional telecom to make sure they can support your contractors that you're bringing on site if that's the model. Even if they're not coming on site, they may need to do something with uh, VPN access to make sure that they can plug into your network to perform the services that they're doing. So IT should always get, get that opportunity to be involved. And if it's IT buying, um, just remember, I gave you guys the shout out and said you needed to be involved, involved procurement and contracting. Um, they really will help you. I cannot emphasize that enough. Procurement and contracting need to be involved in the development of that statement of work and in the planning process. Um, make sure that it is a collaboration. Um, you will have a good mixture of all types of requirements in your statement of work if you're covering your bases. It should not be heavy to any one side or the other. Uh, make sure that you have a solid business requirements document um, explaining how your requirements will be executed, analyzed, and managed. Um, so that's, again, that collaboration. How are these parts going to work together? Who is going to have ownership of that contract? Um, and what pieces of the contract will they own? Thinking about that up front will help you really write a much stronger statement of work. Let's see if I can make this move forward. There we go. Sorry, technical difficulties with my computer that's trying to go to sleep. There we are. So when you're writing requirements, um, you wanna think about SMART objectives. So those are the specific, measurable, achievable, achievable realistic, and time-bound. Um, this is an area that Mary Vickery and I go back and forth on because SMART objectives really do assist in a waterfall methodology. And they are extremely difficult um, to adapt to an agile methodology if you're not thinking about them in the right way. But there's always gotta be that balance between how specific is too specific. You don't wanna be overly prescriptive. You wanna be descriptive enough that the um, responding vendors know what it is that you are looking for. And it has to be strong enough that it is enforceable, but you do not want to limit the innovation that is out there. Those areas where the vendors can really showcase how they can assist your um, agency with their problems. So here are some examples of the difference between a smart requirement and a not so smart requirement. So smart, you want to grow on online registration by 5% by fiscal year end. So the objective is to grow by how much? 5% and in what measurement period? Fiscal year end. Not so smart, maximize potential of agency website traffic. There's nothing there for a contract manager to help you manage. There's no way for a vendor to really achieve that um, or for them to be able to prove that they have achieved, have achieved that because there's no measurement potential in there. So the next one, to reduce licensure 
wait time to less than two minutes by the end of July. Again, it's reduce by how much, less than two minutes by when, end of July. Um, that is a much more specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound um, objective than improved operational performance management through increased automation. So you can see it is, it's almost an art form, trying to take um, what can be a very high level goal and turning it into something that is measurable so that you can later at the end of the contract say, here, we achieved all of the things that we had set out to do. And if you think about it in those terms, I need to be able to present to executive management or to the legislature that I have achieved my objectives, um, it helps you get to that level of detail. And you'll notice here, while we did say we need to grow online registration by 5% or we need to reduce licensure wait time to less than two minutes, we did not say how to do that. We are giving the vendors that leeway to propose their solution for how they will grow that registration or reduce the wait time. That's that um, key component that I was talking about. So even though these objectives are specific, specific measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound, they're smart, they would still fit in an agile development world. We're not saying in what order, we're not saying um, how they need to be done, what program needs to be used. And we're not giving any of those very heavily prescriptive requirements. We're instead focusing on what we are trying to achieve with the completion of the project as a whole. Oops. So when you're developing the statement of work, we've talked about this already, you need to ask, is this an agile versus a waterfall? project, what will make more sense for our agency? Who needs to be on the team to make this succeed? Um, we talked about all of the stakeholders that you can involve, sit down, brainstorm, think through who needs to be on the project team. What risks can we identify in order to mitigate them? All projects have risks. Um, I think this is probably the discipline that I have seen the most lacking um, across the board and customers who use the DIR cooperative contracts program. It's very hard to sit down and think through all of the risks. Um, and you don't have to come up with all of the risks. You need to come up with the most likely risks and think through what steps you would take in order to make them, um, to mitigate them so that they don't impact the success of your project. Um, it's a fun exercise if done right, so I highly recommend you all start working with um, any risk managers that you may have at your agency. Um, contact SORM. I actually reach out to SORM a lot on big projects to ask for their input. Um, use the resources that we have out there. And for those of you who don't know who SORM is, that is the State Office of Risk Management. Um, make sure that you use what is out there to help you write the tightest statement of work that you can. Um, it will really help the success of your projects later. Um, and then finally, determine how you're going to measure that success. Again, this is an almost an afterthought for some people, but if you think about it up front, it will really help guide the way that you are developing your statement of work. Okay, so which is better, waterfall or agile? Neither is really better than the other. You just have to think through what type of project is that you're doing. Waterfall really works well with projects that have assured predictability. Basically, where you're controlling most of um, the outcomes, you know exactly what it is that you need to do. So if you're building something into an existing system, that has parameters already around it. And these are the pieces that we know that we're gonna need. And we know exactly how they need to be done and how they build on one another. Waterfalls are a really good methodology to use. 
Um, Agile was intended for projects that require significant software design and development. So if you're doing a complete system rebuild, you're not just plugging in a component into a system, this is a big build, consider using Agile. Um, you may not be able to upfront predict all of the different components that you're going to need. Um, Agile gives you that flexibility to start building, um, and I'm gonna start using some terms that I'll explain la later for those of you who don't know Agile, um, so that you can start building your user stories and identify what's likely to be in the backlog. Um, start des designing to the epics that you're going to be um, putting together so that you have the ability to get to the end, but along the way, you're getting completed work product that can be put into production as it's completed. Um, you're not waiting to see at the end whether or not this whole big shebang is gonna work. You have throughout the life of the build received components. Before you've accepted them, you've validated that they work in a production environment and you're ready to move forward to the next piece. So Agile really does help reduce a lot of that risk that the big bang approach of waterfall um, creates. Um, and a lot of agencies right now, state agencies are using Wagile. It's a combined waterfall agile approach where they are defining some, some components, they are defining deliverables associated with those components. They have almost an outline for where they wanna go and they stick to that outline. Um, but within each of the uh, chapters of that outline, if you will, they build in an agile methodology and they allow for some things to be completed in one chapter and some things to be moved to a later chapter. So that's a, a component that does work as well. So um, for you, you visual learners out here, so um, this slide is to really show you where the fixed components are. So for waterfall, you have a very fixed scope um, with a planned schedule and a planned budget. It is a plan driven approach. When you are doing an agile, you're really looking for the value that you can get. So you'll have a fixed schedule and a fixed budget. I have to get this done and by the end of the fiscal year, I only have $60,000 to pay. Um, what can I get for it? So your variable there would be your um, scope. How much can I get done? What's gonna go in the backlog? What can be saved for another contract at a later date? Um, how am I going to make sure that all of the stakeholders are engaged in approving them? You're thinking through the value that you're getting. Um, you're not looking at, I'm going to achieve 100% of the scope. Um, let's see next. So waterfall, again, very traditional. You start with your requirements, you move to design, implementation, testing or verification, and maintenance. That's that assured predictability. We know that's the, the path they're going to follow. Your scope is determined and fixed. You plan that complete project from start to finish up front. That's what you put in your scope of work. And the final product is delivered to the customer for approval. Um, you may have deliverables, interim deliverables in, in a waterfall methodology, but it's that final working piece is what you ultimately review and approve. Um, those projects can become rigid and resistant to change. So if you, during your requirements gathering phase, missed something, it is likely to result in um, a huge impact to your schedule because now you're adding scope to something that you thought had a fixed scope. Now you're having to do uh, purchase order change notices to increase funding in order to um, accommodate that increased scope. Um, sometimes your focus in a waterfall methodology is more about following the process. I can't do X because I have not done B yet. 
Um, I have to work through the process before I can get there. Um, and then you miss out on the importance of the product of or product or service which is being delivered. Um, it does require a significant investment of time up front to make sure that you have planned that project adequately. Um, so if you have a, an early sign off of the requirements, um, you and the vendor have shaken, shook hands and said, this is it, this is what we're gonna do. Um, your requirements may not have been fully understood and you have no easy way other than a contract amendment with a resulting change order notice to make corrections to that. Um, and this can drive high costs due to the extra effort in fixing those things that you may have missed. Um, it may cost, cause schedule delays, as I said, so you may not hit schedule timelines that you uh, promised to external stakeholders. Um, it takes very close management and a very mature agency with a very strong understanding of what they're buying in order to make sure that waterfall is successful. This is not to say that it cannot be successful. You just need to make sure that you have those elements in place to ensure your success. So for Agile, um, Agile is great if you don't know everything up front. Um, it is very easy to respond to change because you just work it in and then you figure out which part of the process it'll be developed in. Um, inspect and adapt is an agile best practice used to capture the idea of discovering emergent requires requirements. So they'll build something out. You as a customer look at it and go, oh, I didn't think about the fact that I needed to have a dummy button that says, are you sure you really want to delete everything in this directory? Can we add that? Um, and then the your team can go, oh, yeah. Colleen, did yes. your mute button get hit? We've lost audio. No. Okay, we're back. Never mind. Sorry, internet connectivity is always fun on these things. Um, so where was I? So, oh, inspect and adapt. So as the customer, as the developer is developing, they're presenting what they're developing to the customer. The customer can say, oh, I forgot, blah. The developer can say, oh, you know what? We can work that in. They work it in. And that may affect what's on your backlog, um, how, how much you get done of your backlog. But it's an essential design element that got worked in so that the product works the way you intended it to work, not what they could do within the time that they had been given or the parameters, the requirements that they had been given. Um, the working product is your primary measure of progress. You do not accept a complete sprint unless it is doing everything that you agreed would get done in that sprint. Um, you don't have to accept non-working code. So let me make sure. Yeah, and then they are building um, as each sprint moves forward, you're building more and more capability into that system. But at the base, you have exactly what it is that you need to present. Um, I, I really do like how agile development projects tend to go. So that's Colleen Berkeley's personal opinion, um, because you have that ability to almost be in there with it. But there are drawbacks to agile. Um, this is that methodology. So you can see um, this is a good breakdown on the iterative development. Um, again, for my visual people in the audience, this should help. Um, agile sprints are typically in two to four week segments. They can be shorter, they can be longer. Um, they do require a lot of oversight. So agile is not something that you're like, oh yeah, I'm doing it agile. And then you walk away and you come back and you get what you want 
it requires a lot of customer involvement. Um, they have to be involved within, with the development throughout the process. Um, even if all they're doing is testing, um, or if they're serving as the, the um, oversight, the product owner, they have to be involved. So it does require an investment of time um, and resources on the agency or customer side. Um, the scrum meetings will let you know what's gonna be done for the day. Um, so you're doing those every 24 hours typically, so you can expect to have a 30 minute meeting every morning. Um, but typically they're small chunks of time. Um, and at the end of a sprint, uh, again, typically two to four weeks, you end up with a finished work product something that you can immediately use or action. And at the end of that, you have a sprint retrospective, which is like a lessons learned. Let's talk about what worked in there. Let's talk about what we need to do. What did we have to leave off? Because it just didn't make sense in that sprint based on what it was that we uh, decided to focus on. Has it been added to the backlog? Where does it need to go in the backlog? So it all works together, um, highly collaborative. It's a highly collaborative piece of work. Um, so agile project management is um, incremental and in iterative and focuses on customer value and team empowerment. So since it's focusing so much on that value and empowerment for the customer, you need to make sure that they're involved. So it's in individuals and the interactions versus focusing on the process or the tools. Um, you're looking at getting work products or service, working products or services over that comprehensive documentation that um, you may associate with a deliverable in a traditional waterfall development methodology. A lot of collaboration as opposed to um, contract or customer negotiation where you're negotiating something in and then the vendor walks off with their marching orders comes back however many weeks or months later and says, here's what you said, boss. Um, this is you working day to day, hand in hand with the vendor. Um, and responding to change. So as changes are happening, Agile allows the team to respond to those changes and make the adjustment as opposed to following a rigid project plan and then reporting why they're in the yellow for 90% of the project. Um, so it is challenge, uh, challenging to do Agile, specifically if you have to change the team structure or makeup, um, that can negatively impact the project. If you assign the wrong product owner and they don't have the time to be involved, it can affect your ability to receive the value that you were looking for. Um, you have got to have organizational buy-in to make Agile work. Um, particularly, we're seeing Agile being very difficult for procurement and contracting areas because it's not a traditional contract necessarily. It doesn't have those traditional pay points. And because of the invoicing and pay points, it's very challenging for financial divisions. Um, what do you mean I'm going to get an invoice every two weeks? How am I supposed to pay them? Um, what am I paying them for? There's a lot of organizational buy-in that needs to happen. Um, embedding an agile team within an agency or customer team can be difficult. So make sure your agency is ready before you commit 100% to agile. It's great that your IT department is ready. It's great that your business area may be ready. But if you don't have the buy-in from your other stakeholders, it increases the risk that your Agile project won't work. Um, you have to uh, make sure that your organization understands that changes in priorities are probable. So what you sat down and worked with them on in April by May or June may look different. You have to manage that change and communicate why the priorities change so that they don't expect one product and end up with something completely different because they were divorced from that project and the um, iterative nature of it and how it developed organically. 
So communication becomes very important with Agile. And you have to be able to devote subject matter experts to the project team. So if you have resources that are key resources in other areas, and they are the only people who can assist in an Agile development project, it will be very difficult for them to both keep up with what they are assigned on their day-to-day -day or real job and that Agile development work um, that they will need to have a voice and presence in. So consider your resource constraints as you're making that decision. Um, and finally, you have got to work with your contracting department. I mentioned them at the top of the list, I'll mention them down here. Making sure that they understand what it is, what it is that you are doing how they need to be involved in measuring and where they will come in to ensure contract compliance. Um, so I'm gonna leave this up while I talk. I don't wanna read definitions to you all. So um, I, I'm sorry, I just don't like reading definitions, but um, it is important to know that Agile comes with its whole new set of vocabulary words for your agencies to learn. Um, there's tons of books out there about doing agile, agile terminolo terminology. There's training available. Um, I feel like it's everywhere these days on agile. It's um, available at a fairly low cost. So look around and see what you can find if you want to start familiarizing yourself with the agile terminology. But as IT professionals, you all should start familiarizing yourself with at least the concepts and these definitions on this slide and the next, because these things are used all the time now. Um, every conference I go to, somebody is dropping uh, terms and I had to play catch up to learn about Scrum, or what do you mean retrospective, and what is this sprint review that you're talking about? So, just take a little time um, offline to educate yourself so that you're the smart one in the room. Ooh, all of a sudden my slide stopped there. Uh, current slide. Okay, so I'm gonna pause for questions if there are any before I go to the next segment. So yes, Tom's definitely. looking at the questions. We do need to kind of watch the time. We've got uh, about 11, probably 12 minutes left. Go ahead, Tom. Okay, so there, there is a question here. Um, you mentioned schedule, scope, and you budget for statement of work, but what if we would like for the contractor to provide the budget estimate? So, the contractor can quote you as part of a response to a statement of work, what they think it's gonna cost. You yourself as an agency or a customer should have a dollar figure in mind. Um, and you can do that a variety of ways. You can uh, do a quick request for quote, or um, I think that's probably the easiest way, and just send out a high level hey, we're thinking about doing something like this, about what would that cost me? So that you can build in the, the budget to your entity. Um, but once you've issued a statement of work, you really want to uh, make sure that you have a dollar figure baseline that you are expecting to see back because you will see wildly different numbers and it is very difficult to know which is the right number if you haven't done your research beforehand. I'm gonna put myself on mute so I can take a drink real quick. <clears throat> Next question, Tom. Okay, uh, just a real quick one here. Uh, can you initiate work with vendor before having DIR sign the statement of work? <clears throat> so I believe the statute reads that you cannot pay the vendor for work performed until DIR has signed the statement of work. I personally would not start work with the vendor until I had had DIR sign off on the statement of work just to cover it. Um, the last statement of work review, that final contract review is very fast. It typically takes no more than two or three days. Um, 
I think we are limited to no more than five days um, in that final review. So we can be extremely quick in getting that over to you. And it is better to make sure that you are protected. Um, and who knows what your auditors are gonna look for when they're looking at that file later. Okay, okay. I'm gonna go to the next piece, Tom, um, okay. in the interest of time. So let me start from current slide, building the statement of work. Uh, so standard elements are these, these are really the essential elements of a statement of work. You've got to have the scope. Um, what are you trying to accomplish? The roles and responsibilities. Um, what is your customer doing? What is the vendor responsible for? Any deliverables that you've defined for that statement of work. What is the period of performance or schedule? So the schedule might be um, more for a waterfall where you say, I need this done by this month and this done by this other month. Um, period of performance will be no longer than August 31st of 2021. Um, any service levels that you have associated with this, um, you can set them. You can also ask the vendors to provide them for you and make them an evaluation point. Um, acceptance criteria. So if you have standard acceptance criteria, you can publish them in the statement of work. I think it's a good idea. Um, and you can also leave it open that during negotiation, specific deliverable acceptance criteria will be defined. Um, pricing and payment schedules or milestones. So if there are specific milestones that you know that you need them to meet, and those are the ones that you're willing to pay for, call them out in the statement of work. Um, let them know. If the invoices are due on a monthly basis, no later than the 10th of the month, following the month the work was um, achieved in, spell that out so the defenders know what to expect. And finally, any assumptions that you may have made um, as the customer consuming the services. Here is a sample table of contents. Um, yours does not have to look like this. This is just a sample. You may not want to get um, as detailed as this. You may want to move them around in whatever order your agency um, has, but this is what we tend to look for. Um, and it's a good checklist to make sure you have thought through things like, is there any um, agency furnished equipment and workspace that you're giving to the vendor? Or what is the vendor responsible for pro providing for themselves? And um, additional items to consider. Again, security, security, security. Are there additional security standards that go beyond what you're, you would typically use for a statement of work? Accessibility compliance. Um, so that is, if you're doing software development, it has to conform to accessibility standards. Spell that out for them. What is it that you wanna see to make sure that they have the ability? Um, introduction and background. This is a really um, important section that I think that we as customers for vendors tend to not give enough weight to. This is where you set the stage for why I am doing the solicitation in the first place, what business problem that I am trying to solve. Um, if you spell the story for them and you do it well, you'll get stronger responses back. You need to consider including any evaluation and response submission requirements. Um, they need to know how they're supposed to submit the responses to you and what you are looking at. Um, those are where their protest points are going to come up if you do not clearly tell them what you're looking at. If you have any additional terms and conditions, so if you're using a DIR contract, we do have base terms and conditions. You are allowed to strengthen our base terms and conditions, but you should not be um, doing anything to weaken them. Um, transition plan. And I'm sorry, I don't know why it keeps bouncing off of this. Um, other considerations, is it going to be in DCS? Um, what's that going to look like? And uh, qualifications, all the standard procurement stuff. Um, this is a very text dense slide. This is talking about what you would explain in um, an agile scope of work. Again, I'm not going to read it. The slides will be made available to you so that you can review it in the future. 
Um, but this really is just explaining why you're doing Agile, what you're trying to achieve, and what the goal is. Um, any backlog, if you have functional requirements um, and you have done the work already to identify any epics and user stories, you can include those in your statement of work. You can allow the vendor to sort the items that you've given and break it into their own um, idea of what user stories and epics um, need to be grouped where. You can do that as part of the negotiation process um, when you're negotiating with the vendor. I do recommend you sit down at some point before you ink the contract to talk through this um, if you're doing an agile development project, just to make sure that there really is a true meeting of the minds regarding how you're going to handle these project backlogs, what the epics look like, how many story points in a user story um, that you're going to get, and the length in, of the sprints and the size of those teams. Um, having that understanding instead of dictating it out but working with the vendor to come up with the right fit you will tend to get a more successful partnership and you will end up with a better product at the end um, this is more about the collaboration um, the last bullet point the training of end users on the systems do consider that um, regardless of your method this is on an agile slide but consider if there's any training that's going to be um, required in your waterfall product make sure that you have addressed that in the contract as you're building the statement of work um, and that it's covered because training training materials um, train the trainer how that all is going to happen um, will also help ensure project success if there is no training and you've got a new system, what um, think about the impact to the business areas at that point who don't know how to use a new system that's been dropped on their lap and how that will negatively impact their ability to perform their required tasks. So training is very important to think about upfront and work through and keep an eye on through the process. Um, if you're creating deliverables. Make sure that you think through what it is that you're creating as a deliverable. I've talked about the deliverables expectation document. You can include a draft in the solicitation. You can finalize it in negotiations. You could ask them to respond back with it. Again, there's a lot of flexibility in your solicitation document, depending on your particular needs to get back what it is that you need, but before you finalize a contract or immediately after, um, make sure that you have a meeting of the minds regarding how deliverables are going to look, what they will contain, and what you are as, as the customer are looking for to accept them. Um, if you do it prior to signing the contract, you as a customer will have more leverage. That is the ideal time to agree to these things when the vendor is still seeking the work and has not been guaranteed the work. If you try to do it after signing, it's a lot harder to get through um, and negotiate in some of the safety nets that you may need. So consider that as well and build the time into your internal procurement schedule. Um, it will really make a big difference. Um, you'll also talk about what they need to submit um, and to whom they need to submit all of those deliverable documents. Um, you may capture the dates. If you decide that you're going to capture specific dates like July 6th of 2020 as a due date, make sure that you are not capturing it in a way that will require you to do multiple contract amendments if those dates need to shift. So you can have a transition schedule that lives as something that is incorporated by reference into the contract, as opposed to having it be a signed piece of the contract and thus subject to the uh, amendment process. Um, but think through all of the different um, impacts that it will take because that contract piece, um, how we make changes, what it's going to do, can be a barrier to project speed once a contract is awarded if you hadn't thought through them up front. 
Um, I kind of just cover that revised schedule. Um, kickoff meetings. Kickoff meetings are super important. And right now with uh, the pandemic going on, they're super scary. You can do these all virtual. Um, just make sure that you have spelled it out. So you can say um, it's either going to be at the customer or vendor's location or via video or teleconference as dictated by the um, customer's contract manager or point of contact. Make sure you have that flexibility to alter in-person meetings to teleconference meetings, um, particularly where we are today. Um, and then make sure that you have the vendors provide their own software unless you have additional licenses to provide them. Um, or if they have propo proposed a collaboration tool um, for this effort that they're engaging on your behalf, make sure that they include those licenses um, in an adequate number that your agency staff can participate. So it's little things like that that can actually cause big disruptions and delays. Um, we've talked about acceptance, any testing, um, and Joy, feel free to jump in if I'm getting too close to time. I know I've got three minutes. <laughs> yeah, we will need to wrap pretty quick, but you do have that much. Um, so here's a project work plan example. Um, it's this is um, obviously it's got sprint iterations in here, so it's more appropriate for an agile. But you can see how it's first one and then deliverable number two is going to be these three development products. So you can have multiple um, components within a single deliverable. Um, you do not have to do them um, singletons, especially if they're small pieces of work. Consider bundling those for a price. Um, so two ways to agile your contract. This is how Herschel, uh, one of Herschel's favorite things to talk about. So if you're going to do the single vendor route, you could go um, solicit your vendors and award to a single vendor and to agile development work with one, or you could do a multiple award where you solicit vendors, you award to multiple qualified vendors, um, and then you basically within that compete um, additional work based on the success of the sprints that they are doing. So if vendor A does a great job on sprint one and then sprint two kind of falls off, maybe you bring um, vendor B up for sprint three and see how vendor B does. Um, the nice thing about doing agile development is that it's really easy to switch those vendors in and out because they're competing small seg segments of work for you. Um, and this is what your pricing could look like. So you've again, you've got the deliverables. Um, and then when you bundle them, maybe you're going to pay for two through four $100,000 price range. And that covers however many sprint iterations that are in there. So you can play around with this, get it to look more like a traditional invoice that your budget folks will accept um, and still make sure that you're getting the work that you need. And here's an alternate agile pricing um, model where you're basically saying that it's going to be about 100 days to do this work, the baselining effort, and then each um, sprint or iteration will be no more than $500,000 per sprint. We don't know how many sprints we're going to have yet, but you have given your internal finance people, my ultimate budget for this is $5 million. So you know that the max number of sprints that you could have would be X amount based on the $500 price range and you work from there. All right, general questions and wrap up. So we're going to do a wrap real quick. We may take one or two questions and then we'll go into the bonus session for those of you from state agencies that want that piece and the others can read. Go ahead and advance one if you would, please. Uh, we do have the CPE form for IRMs or for the contact hours in the handout pane. And there's also a PDF of this deck if you want to download those. 
if you didn't get your question answered and you have more, we're just going to we'll give you some contact information in just a moment. Again, go back to the DIR calendar to see other events going on. You can subscribe to our discussion lists. We are planning to make a recording available and we'll post that on the DIR calendar. Um, let's see, Colleen has some useful links here. I don't know if you want to mention any of those in particular, Colleen. Um, so the SOW page you should look at, in addition to information on statements of work, there are two sample templates that you can just uh, use and uh, adapt to make your own. So there's one for Waterfall and one for Agile. So I do recommend that you check there. And if you were clueless when I was uh, briefly touching on accessibility and you want more information about that, the EIR accessibility page is a good page to go to. Okay. And you get you have that, you can download it from the handout pane. Let's go ahead and go one more forward. So here are the contact points. Mary, who was originally going to speak, and Colleen, who has graciously done today's presentation. So why don't we just maybe go ahead and take two questions, then we'll move into the bonus sec section. Tom, you got and a question or two for us? I do, and if we don't get all of them answered, please feel free to reach out to Colleen um, with her email address. You've got it right there on the screen, and she will be glad to, to get your question answered. Uh, question is, Agile projects are based on user stories, which are not always time-bound and therefore not SMART goals. How do you incorporate user stories into an SOW? So you may have user stories um, that are defined at a basic level. I am a user who's coming into the DIR website in order to find legislative information. Um, I need to be able to get there in less than four clicks. So that's my a basic user story I just came up with and it could suck. So I apologize. Um, but you can include those basic things that you have defined in the statement of work so that at least your vendor audience has a picture of the users that will be using the product that they're developing. I, I, I am not a state agency, I'm a non-state agency who needs more information um, on, I don't know, county involvement in DIR contracting. How do I find that on the DIR website? Um, so you create all of the different users, you talk about what that user is trying to accomplish, and again, those are very sketchy, high-level, non-detail related user stories. Um, and then you start walking through it with the vendor. And you can do that as part of a clarification discussion set that might happen as part of your procurement process. And you can use it as a down select. So you do initial scoring. You then go to face-to-face um, -face conversations with a subset of your um, respondents. You start talking through it and define what those are through the process. And then maybe you issue a request for a revised offer or a BAFO, depending on your agency policy, to those subset of vendors with the newly created and defined user stories based on what you just learned. Um, and then you refine them even more in the negotiation process. So you can go from very basic high level to a much more defined um, process within your procurement process in general. Okay, and I think in the essence of time now, Colleen, we'll go ahead and go into the next session. Okay, so if you are not a state agency, please feel free to drop off. Now, um, the information is pertinent to the statement of work review processes mandated for state agencies. Um, but there is a question and answer period at the end if you have more questions that you'd like to have answered. Okay, so statutory requirements. So this is per Texas Government Code Section 2157.0685 and TAC Rule 212, um, which basically says if you have a statement of work and you are a state agency and you're going to award it or um, solicit it under a DIR contract, DIR is obligated to review it if it is over $50,000. 
So you have to submit it to DIR for their review and approval before issuing the solicitation. So um, we do see a lot of uncertainty and we do get a lot of requests to review after an agency has posted a statement of work to the electronic state business daily. Um, this process is supposed to happen prior to the issuance of the statement of work. It comes into our portal. Mary Vickery, is, who is our guru on all things statement of work related, does that review. Um, and then she will provide you not only with approval, but very substantive feedback and questions for you to consider to help tighten that statement of work for you. Um, we are mandated to provide that services, those services, and if you are a state agency, you are mandated to use those services. Um, you can then conduct your statement of work solicitation against the DIR contracts. Again, this is not an open market solicitation. These are for statements of work with the AIS code indicator on the controller's website. Um, and it's a fairly fast process, no more than 30 days, um, typically much faster than that before you get to the review. You do the solicitation to the DIR vendors. Once you're ready to make the award, you sign off, negotiate and sign off with the vendor and send it back to us for that final review and approval to make sure that your scope and um, agreement with the vendor did not drastically alter from the initial review. Um, so before I go to common findings, are there any questions about that? Uh, there, uh, there is one question. Is the $50,000 threshold for initial implementation costs or does that cover the full contract amount? Full contract amount. So if you are going to spend more than $50,000 for the services that you are writing the statement of work for, BIR needs to review that statement of work. Okay. That's it. So common findings. This is what Mary is catching all the time when she does her reviews of statement of work. Um, and uh, guys, I cannot tell you how good Mary is at doing these SOW reviews. She is looking for anything that will um, vary from the requirements of the DIR contract, um, any areas where the agency may be exposed to risk, and then for things like um, acronyms should be defined on the first use, those are any areas where your contract or your solicitation document may not be easily understood by the vendors. Um, so she will give you feedback like your acronyms need to be defined on the first use. Um, do not post the statement of work to the ESVD um, because it's supposed to be competed against the cooperative contracts vendors. And if you do post the statement of work to the ESVD in addition to soliciting the co-op vendors, and you want to award to a vendor who is not on the cooperative contracts, you have to either get an exemption after the fact, which DIR can't give you, um, or you're going to have to go back to the vendor that you just spent all of that time negotiating with and say, I'm sorry, I can't award to you. You're not on the DIR contract. Um, this does cost a lot of time and we see agencies suffering with this a lot. It's easily eliminated if you only compete to the cooperative contract vendors using the email contact addresses associated with each of those contracts. Um, subcontracting. All DIR vendors have hub subcontracting plans that are associated with their contracts. They are allowed to subcontract, but only to the vendors listed on their subcontracting plan. So we do see sometimes where 
an agency is ready to award and they haven't checked to make sure that the vendor that was listed as a subcontractor was currently on the contract holder subcontracting plan. Um, so then we have to stop and make sure that the vendor either proposes an already approved subcontractor that's listed on their HSP or our hub coordinator, Lynn, will have to step in and make sure that that happens. Um, this does not mean that you, the agency, has to ask them to resubmit a hub subcontracting plan. Um, but you can, in your statement of work, encourage them to update their subcontracting plan, their HSP with DIR, with any vendors that may not be listed. So you basically are proactively telling them that they need to make sure their HSP is updated with any vendors being proposed for your particular, um, particular solicitation. Um, I'm looking at her next bullet point. To avoid misrepresentation that this SOW is for professional services, not consulting services. So a lot of agencies are using the term consulting services. We are looking for a vendor to provide consulting services and assist us with, and then I'll use the procurement services category under the bits. Um, you're actually not looking for professional services or consulting services. You're looking for those services that um, are subject to DIRs oversight. Um, you're not looking at the professional or consulting services as defined by Texas Government Code 2254. So just say that you're looking for technical services or um, research and advisory services, but not professional services or consulting services. Um, that requires publishing to the Texas Register. Um, it used to um, require govern governor approval. So just be mindful. Insurance requirements, make sure that um, you check the base contract, see what insurance DIR requires. If you have additional requirements, that's fine. Just make sure they are in line with the DIR contract, but Mary does catch some where they're um, out of alignment. Any additional terms and conditions that you want to add to it cannot diminish the um, terms and conditions established by the base contract. There is an entire process that DIR has to go through if it looks as if you are weakening or diminishing, um, where we have our general counsel's office look at and make a ruling on. It can slow up approval, um, but ultimately it puts your agency at risk. So you may request um, an exception to that rule if you absolutely need to weaken or diminish. What we are finding, though, is that agencies are just taking their standard T's and C's. Um, they're not reviewing them and they're slapping them on top as part of their PO and contracting process um, without realizing that they're duplicating or weakening what DIR has already established. So um, if you've got an attorney with some time on their hands, you may want to have them review the standard terms and conditions that DIR has available on the contracts. You can pull them off of our website and then do a matchup between your standard terms and conditions. Identify those areas where there's duplication and where um, there's that possible winking or diminishing and then prepare for you a set that they feel is appropriate for use on DIR contracts. Um, and then survivability. So all DIR contracts do have a survivability clause contained within them where your issuance of a contract to a vendor, um, a statement of work to a vendor with a purchase order will survive up to two years beyond the life of that current DIR based contract. So if it is expiring on September 1, 2020, you've awarded your contract on August 31, 2020, um, that DIR contract is still in effect for two years post um, 
its expiration of September 1. You'll have that base contract. So just know that that is there. It's a, it's a safety net in case that contract expires while your purchase order is still active. But beyond that two years, DIR is not necessarily able to work with or enforce DIR-based terms for your agency. And let's see. That's what I got. Something is, so I'm on the question slide, but something is pausing my sharing. Hmm. You gotta love technology, but we so appreciate that. We are at the end. What is your schedule? Do you have a couple of minutes or do you need to wrap up? Our end time yep. was 3.15. Yep, I have time. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Okay. okay. So let's consider it officially over but those that might want to stay on a few minutes will take a few more questions last reminder you do have the cpe form from dir and the presentation in the handout pane and you will see an evaluation as you exit we would really appreciate that so we'll just see what questions we have and how much time colleen has tom if you could facilitate for us sure um a couple of recent questions here um, if the statement of work is over five million, would it go? Would it go to ESPD? Does EIR review these also? Um, you would think that that is a simple answer. Right now, it is not. The IR is currently working that out with the comptroller. So DIR's uh, definitions in TAC 212 state that the initial term. Um, is the contract value that has to be below five million so it is possible that a statement of work could be awarded for greater than five million if the initial term and each subsequent term in term in and of itself is less than that five million dollar threshold we are responsible for reviewing that statement of work um, right now we are discussing with comptroller whether or not the contract advisory team review is also appropriate. Um, so I don't have a firm answer for you. The IR does not necessarily believe that that secondary review is necessary, um, but it may be a problem with the definitions um, and with the total contract value, which drives that. So we're working with the controller to come up with the right answer. Uh, another question, what type of SOWs would DIR not want to look at? Um, you know, if it is for uh, like a straight telecom buy or a straight commodity purchase, I don't need to see a statement of work for a commodity purchase. But other than that, like the deliverable space IT services absolutely 100% have to go to DIR for review. Um, if you're using any of our cloud contracts with a statement of work associated with them or any of the web development contracts, software development contracts, those would absolutely have to go to DIR for review. Um, it is safer for you to submit any statement of work to us, and then Mary will just kick it back very quickly and say, we don't need to review this. Um, that doesn't take much time for us to look at it and go, oh, no, we don't need this. But um, I would rather, as a purchaser myself, I would rather be safe than sorry. Okay, uh, another question. Um, in an agile procurement, how do you control increases in cost due to changes in priority or requirements changing based upon what the team learns in the sprints? So this is, um, it's a wonderful question. It's hard to explain in Agile, but because you have set up front, my budget is $5 million. I will not exceed it. Any changes in scope, or things that you have learned through the process 
just move some of the other development efforts or user stories um, into the product backlog. And Agile, they just build and develop until they run out of money. So there would not ever be an increase, but you may not get 100% of the um, envisioned functionality that you had up front. Um, but because of the iterative nature of Agile and how it builds, you will get 100% of the necessary, um, I need this in order to be able to operate. So you may end up with an application that meets accessibility requirements and does exactly what you need it to do, but because you ran out of funding, it is not the uh, blue, green, pink um, color scheme that you wanted, and it does not have, um, I don't know, a banner page that scrolls across. It doesn't end up with the nice to haves, but it does meet all of the have to haves of your development. Okay. That question? Yeah. Okay, next question. Will, be, will you be covering a statement of work for software as a service? Um, so we, we could put something together um, as a statement of work for software as a service and a presentation. We don't currently have a presentation regarding that. Um, and whether or not we would review it, um, I would send it to us, as I said, and let us see. Because software as a service has complexities to it. It is not just buying software. There's um, services that are associated with it. And sometimes a statement of work is appropriate and a review is necessary. Okay, and I do think we have a, a follow-up. Um, when you'd ask, does that answer your question? So I'll go to this question next, Colleen. And, okay. and it says, in that case, in Agile, how do you ensure project success if your needs at the end are more than the funding you identified at the beginning? And so if you have a functioning product um, that you can deliver, and you should because you're only accepting the sprint when it delivers the desired functionality, I guess in that case, if you ran out of funding before you ended up with 100% of the functionality that you needed, you could measure your success based on the amount of functionality that you achieved within the budget that you had set. Um, you are able to add additional funding to Agile products, um, projects, or you can also plan another Agile project after completion of the first with the additional funding. But um, in the specific scenario that you have played out, I've run out of funding and I have not achieved all of the functionality, um, I would measure it based on the amount of functionality that I did achieve um, and say that I achieved 85% of what we envisioned with the budget that we needed. Okay, uh, next question. Does a contract award need to be posted on the ESBD? Um, so, we actually asked that same question about three weeks ago. Uh, and then we did research because no one could answer that question. It appears the vast majority of state agencies are posting their contract awards under co-op contracts to the ESBD. Um, that is not a definitive answer. That is the trend that we are seeing. Um, it must be posted to your website though. Okay. Uh, next question. Can you could, can you explain the over 5 million DIR review of the SOW again? So DIR's review of contract or statements of work um, says that if it's over $50,000, that it's subject to DIR review. DIR's um, 
legislation, um, I can't remember, authority, DIR statutory authority states that you um, customers may not purchase more than $5 million um, or cannot exceed $5 million um, for the total contract term. DIR's TAC 212 definition said total contract uh, states that total contract value is defined as being the initial contract term. So if your initial contract term is less than $5 million and more than $50,000, it is subject to DIR rule um, and DIR statutory authority. If your contract is an initial term with, let's say it's two one-year renewals, and each of those renewal options is just under $5 million. So we'll, we'll make it easy. Um, it's $4 million for the initial term, and it's $4 million for each of the renewal terms. So DIR defines the total contract value to be the initial term, the $4 million. It would be subject to review. It is under statutory authority, so you could award a potentially $12 million award under a DIR contract per DIR PAC 212 definitions. So you can exceed that $5 million DIR cap because of the DIR definition and TAC 212 definitions of what uh, contract value is, total contract value. Okay. I believe taking one more quick quick peek here. Um, it, it, there was a question asked SOW versus DBIT, but I think we need a little more clarification on that question. If you can um, give us a little more uh, substance to your question. And then there were also a couple of other ones, ROM and billing unit costs. Again, we need a little more clarification on your question. <laughs> And we had someone write in a compliment about Mary Vickery and how invaluable she is. And we absolutely agree. Mary is wonderful, as is all of our procurement team. Yeah, but I agree. Mary is exceptionally wonderful. <laughs> so you know, at this, we're at a good at stopping point. Covers... Or have you got one more, Tom? No, I, um, I was just going to say, I think we have covered all the all the relevant questions that we can answer uh, today. Yeah, I can tell you, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that ROM tends to stand for rough order of magnitude, which is um, how you can come up with what your budget is. You really are just looking to get a rough order of magnitude so that you know where those uh, bids should be coming in. So I'm going to try to tie that together. I don't know about the SOW versus DBITs. Well, when we originally planned this, we had discussed should we have the bonus section be 15 minutes or 30 minutes. So it sounds like maybe next time we'll just start with a plan for 30 minutes. Lots of good questions. Again, this is Joy Hall Bryant. I'm with IRM Outreach. I really appreciate the procurement folks working with me on this. We had a lot of people who intended to uh, attend the uh, DIR Connect that was planned for April, a lot of the IT people, and some of the IRMs in particular needed hours in contracting. And when that got moved to fall, they were looking for both knowledge and hours. So I had approached Lynn and her team asking, could we do a couple of webinars? And they have such a wealth of knowledge. And then Colleen, thank you. Stepping in last minute like this, we so appreciate it. And Tom and Tracy helping out. And I believe we also have Sarah online. So kudos to all of you who are sharing your expertise today. Thank you, Joy. And thank you so much for all the organization that you did on this. We really appreciate it.
Again, if you didn't get your question answered and you have something you want to pursue, you've got the contact point, both Mary's and Colleen's in the deck. You can download the CPE form or the presentation from the deck and we'll also send a follow-up email. Any last minute, last words, Tom, Colleen? Uh, we do have one more question. I don't know if we would like to address it or if we should recommend that you reach out to Colleen directly. Colleen's time, ask. I've got time for one more. Okay. One so more, the, last question and, and then we'll say goodbye. And this is the, the clarification from when we needed, uh, when we looked at the questions a little bit ago. Uh, the, the question is, is when should we use a statement of work template and when should we use the DBITS template? So the statement of work templates that are available on the DIR website are for use with DBITS. So they, there's not a when, um, they are for use, they were designed for use with DBITS and other DIR contracts in mind. So they may be one and the same. Okay, thank you. That, that answers uh, all the questions in the chat box right now. Well, I think that, that we'll call that right. a wrap again. Cool. Appreciate everybody. Colleen, you wanna say goodbye for to us as well. Bye, thank you all. I appreciate you uh, sitting through all of this with me. <laughs> nice job, Colleen. Everybody have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.